central bank. We passed an income tax, which was highly controversial and required a Supreme Court decision. All of this was the late 1800s, early 1900s. But the real uses of government, the sustained American to a new industrial age, came along in the New Deal, as you well know, in the 1930s. It was partly a consequence, if not largely a consequence, of the Great Depression, when the unemployment rate went to 25%, when industrial production dropped by 50%, when Americans were in pain, when it was impossible to believe any longer that an unfettered free market would produce all the goods and services you needed and keep unemployment at a minimum. The economic argument that that was possible prevailed until the 1930s. If you went to school and studied economics in most economics departments in America, that's basically what you learned. Now, there were some exceptions, but you don't read about them very much today. They were called institutional economists, generally speaking. Disciples of men like John Collins and Thorstein Devlin. John Kenneth Galbraith was one of those. You don't hear much about him these days either. Economies self-adjust, we were told in the 1920s. You don't have to worry about government. The Depression proved in the minds, but more important, in the hearts and souls of Americans, that wasn't the case. And we accepted regulation. We accepted the building of, uh, of great government uh, structures. We accepted jobs programs. We accepted social security. And we even talked about national health care. But we never fully got aboard all of those things. Social Security, for example, had to be sold by FDR, uh, had to be uh, funded by a, a FDR, at least thought, by a tax that made it seem that it was dependent on how much you earned. Your return was dependent, your return uh, when you retired was dependent on how much you earned, and you were taxed at the workplace. It made it feel like a pension when it wasn't. It could have been financed out of progressive taxes, but that just wasn't gonna work in America. So there were compromises even then. But the progressive march, by and large, kept going, not without exceptions. In the Eisenhower years, there were interruptions. The National Health Insurance Plan that Roosevelt would have liked, I believe, that Truman kind of supported never got anywhere because of the extreme opposition of the American Medical Association. They have been replaced in their opposition by big pharmaceutical companies, drug companies, uh, but the AMA is still pretty powerful. Onward we went, but basically this, this sense, this faith in government was retained. This faith in government that was created by FDR was retained. We came out of that depression. We started to come out of it in the mid-30s, then we made some policy mistakes again. We went back into a deep recession in 37, and with World War II's extreme levels of spending, we came out of it for good. We were launched upon the two greatest decades of economic growth in America, when all incomes rose together, the 1950s, and the 1960s. And we still, even in that prosperous period, believed we needed government to make things fair. We expanded the benefits of Social Security in those years. We invested in research. We built the space program. We invested aggressively in schools and in college education. We developed the GI Bill. Don't you have to laugh? when the governor of New Jersey talks about how his father made it on the basis of the GI Bill and five minutes later talks about how government is getting in our way, or how Paul Ryan talks about how his grandmother was helped by Social Security and that somehow twists this into some anti-government idea about how we have to cut Social Security sharply to save it. This is a side issue, but let me say it clearly. The Ryan-Romney plans to save Social Security and Medicare, save it by cutting people out of it and cutting benefits for all participants in it. Sure, you can save it that way. You can cut it in half, and sure, it's going to be financed. 
but it's not going to be Social Security and it's not going to be Medicare. It's a pretty horrible trick. So what happened? How did we get to a point where this idea, this anti-government idea, grew and dominated the thinking of the nation? I think it happened in the 1970s, and I always use these two dates as bookends. In 1971, when Ronald Reagan, the president, was still governor of California, in his second term, he decided he was not conservative enough. This remarkable, talented, and dangerous man was very ambitious. He started in public office when he was 55, his first public office, and wanted to be president by the time he was 56. Of course, he had to serve out the term governor of California. He couldn't get the presidential nomination in 68, forgetting quite my years. He went on to win a second term. He was kind of a, a practical governor. He knew how to make compromises, and he knew how to twist the knife, welfare queens and so forth. He knew how to uh, employ a little bit of racist uh, hinting to get ahead. But by and large, he was practical. And then he decided, maybe I've been too practical. How am I going to be president? They don't think I'm conservative enough. So he came up with this idea. He didn't like my book, Age of Greed, has this story. Came up with this idea, or at least some of his, and the people who worked for him. Let me get a proposition, a referendum out before the people to change the California Constitution to cut their income taxes significantly and permanently. So he paraded up and down the state, campaigned hard as heck for this. Californians said, no, we don't want to cut our income taxes. Proposition one was defeated with a 55, 54, 55 percent majority. America was still a nation that believed in government. Six years later, it was early 72, six years later, 1978, you know what happened. Proposition 13, the man, I'm mad as hell guy, I forgot his name, Jarvis. He had a role in the movie Airplane. Probably even 20-year-olds had memorized their plan. It was such a popular movie. Jarvis convinced Californians to cut property taxes sharply, to limit their rise, and even more importantly, to require that any tax is still around, Jarvis. Still parading right there. Uh, to limit any to limit any tax increase by any, the, any legislature in the state of California to get a tax increase, you needed a two-thirds vote. That was even more important than cutting property taxes. That people don't always realize that. That has crippled finances in the state of California to this day. When you read about California's problems, it was the distortions created by this two-thirds requirement. In any case, six years, we had a tax revolt in America. What happened in those six years, 1972 to 1978? We had a horrid economy, high inflation, high unemployment. People were scared to death. I bought my first car in 1978 or 79. It was, uh, I won't tell you what it was. And uh, my interest rate was 18%. I look at the young people, they don't seem surprised. In other words, I paid one-fifth of the price of that car every year in interest payments alone. Now imagine that uh, interest payment for housing. Americans were scared. Inflation was rising at 12% a year. The price of food was rising even faster in certain years. The price of gasoline, the Arab oil embargo, skyrocketed. America panic and America's political leaders panic. It gets more complicated. Chapter 11 of my book, Age of Greed, 39.99. No, I'm kidding. Um, it's in paperback. It's only 19 bucks now. I'm still kidding. I'll tell you the story. Uh, Milton Friedman came along. We started having deficits. There was a, the first big round of deficit phobia in the post World War II period. What we're going through today, deficits are our biggest problem. President Obama agrees with this. They're not. They're not our biggest problem. All of that uh, came together to begin to turn America conservative. 
Proposition 13 in 1978 was the start of a tax revolt that swept America. It wasn't only local taxes. There was a movement to raise the federal income, to cut the federal income tax. Jack Kemp, the Buffalo Bills quarterback, was the congressman from, and a very popular and charismatic guy he was, was the congressman from Buffalo. William Roth, senator from Delaware, got together and proposed cutting income taxes by 30%. Sounded crazy, except guess what? It was catching on. It was catching on by 1978. Jimmy Carter had to worry about it when he was going to run for president in 1980. And there were other Proposition 1s and Proposition 13s across the nation. Ronald Reagan became president in 1981. <clears throat> the famous line was, uh, it's not you who are the problem, it's government that's the problem. There were more famous lines, but they're not coming to mind. You'll have to look them up in my book. <laughs> um, uh, he basically passed the Kent Roth tax bill in 1981. A milder version of it, but an extreme version of it. It was the beginning of America's troubles today. Cut taxes for the rich and begin to deregulate like crazy. Clobber the labor unions. Look for scapegoats for people's problems. The reason the 72 to 78 period was, in my mind, the main chain catalyst that changed America. And there were other, a few other factors, I should probably mention, them. but that was the main one, was when people are in economic pain, they are rarely very progressive. Now you might say the Great Depression is the counterexample. There are arguments why that was an exception. Uh, I won't quite go into that. It could be the pain was so severe it crossed another threshold. Economic pain does not necessarily bring liberal government, American liberal government. It often results in seeking safe, uh, uh, scapegoats. And government became the great scapegoat in America, beginning in the 70s, through the 80s, the 90s, and the 2000s. Bill Clinton did not turn that boat around. He, by and large, climbed aboard. He tried here and there. We got an expansion of the earned income tax credit. We got a family leave program. We got a few other things. So we got an increase in taxes for the well-off. But by and large, Bill Clinton's legacy, from my point of view, is the famous line, it's the end of the era of big government. The era of big government is over, he said in 1996. And in his latest book, which I was lucky enough to be able to review in the New York Times, they, they allowed me to review it because they asked a very conservative man to review my book, and they thought I deserved a chance to get some revenge. In any case, Bill Clinton did not admit I didn't even think he raised that line in this book. He, he kind of rewrote the history of his administration. Not that there weren't some achievements, but by and large, he didn't turn this ideological boat around. What did we get in the 2000s? Cut taxes for the well-off some more, cut taxes for everybody, but especially the well-off. And what kind of economy did we get? We got the slowest job growth economy in the post-World War II period. The seven years of the Bush, George W. Bush, two terms, not including the 2008 devastating recession, the seven years we had the slowest rate of job growth of, um, under any president, including his father, since the Great Depression. Tax cuts don't work to generate solid growth, except in certain specific kinds of circumstances. We are being asked to believe in a repeat of that message. But bug me about uh, President Obama. I'm just getting warmed up. I'm just getting in my themes here. Um, so, no, I'm kidding. John Kenneth Galbraith would always say, you've probably heard this. But he'd always say, well, I always say, I'm more or less in the middle of your speech. Okay, this is the, my last point. You kind of get people a little excited. Say, okay, not too more. This big guy is a very tall guy, as you, know, as you may have known. 
in any case, what, what are we being at? Here's what uh, 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 bugs me a little bit about President Obama. He hasn't strongly defended his domestic economic program. I just don't know why. I just can't, I, you know, I, I think about it, it's a kind of psychological issue. No, we didn't have a strong economy, but you know what he did? He stopped the depression. And that's the truth of the matter. That stimulus plus loose Federal Reserve policy, lower interest rates, plus something called quantitative easing, stop the probability. Now, depression is a loosely defined term, but stop the probability of a far more severe recession. Unemployment of 10%? Think 12 or 14%. He stopped that. Now, did he do enough? No, not in my view. Did he talk about what he did enough? Not even close. I'm not even sure he believes it. In fact, he bought into the austerity myth, which is we've got to cut those deficits as soon as possible. Not true. Maybe someday we have to cut those deficits, but we don't have to cut them now. Indeed, if we don't get a bigger deficit in 2013, there is at least a 50% chance we're going to have another recession. You want a recession starting at 8% unemployment? The last one started at what, 5.5% unemployment? We got up to 10%? You want one starting at 8%? How long are the American people going to tolerate this? And who will they turn to then? I think Obama's going to win. But who are they going to turn to then? So I'm concerned. I'm pretty darn concerned. What Obama should have said was, I stopped this recession. And you know what you would have done, Governor Romney? You would have created a depression. You would have said no stimulus. You would have put oral pressure on the Federal Reserve not to loosen because those banana heads who are your economic advisors kept saying, we're going to have runaway inflation and super high interest rates if you do what I actually did. I being President Obama. His advisors forecast runaway inflation and skyrocketing interest rates. You know that didn't happen, right? We would have had something like a serious depression under Romney's economic philosophy. Why the president couldn't say that? And maybe I'm wrong, maybe you shouldn't have. That's the truth of the matter. Here are my main points, right? We always had an active government in America. It wasn't big as a proportion of GDP in terms of tax revenues or even spending, but it was big in terms of legal activity, in terms of regulations, in terms of general influence. When you include the state governments, we built the canals, we built the public schools. We sanitized ourselves. Ultimately, I'm, uh, this is like class I'm reviewing. Ultimately, we subsidized the railroads. Didn't show up in the accounts, right? Government owned all that land and gave it to the railroads. If that passing of the land was included in revenue, government would have looked a lot bigger in the 1800s. Government gave money to universities, schools, colleges. They gave land to universities, the so-called land-grant universities. Berkeley, MIT, I think Ohio State, lots of other places. Sorry, I don't have more examples. They were started because they had these land grants. They could build on the land, but they could also sell the land to finance themselves. On and on. Powerful, important government is not new in America, number one. Number two, government changed over these years. We didn't know we needed high schools in 1789 when we signed the Constitution. We didn't even really know we needed canals that badly. Canals were important in, in, uh, in the Netherlands and, and England, of course, to commerce. But it wasn't that clear that we needed government support of canals. We didn't know we needed high schools. We didn't know, surely, before Pasteur and other, uh, others who developed uh, germ theory, that we had to sanitize cities to make them work, or even that we could. We didn't know any of that. We learned. And when we were successful as a country, we changed government to do what it had to do. And we stopped thinking in those terms in the 1970s. We don't have a universal pre-K system. And we know so much about how important it is for young children to be nourished before kindergarten. And we've done nothing about that as a nation at a federal level. We have not 
lived up to the legacy of America. We haven't invested in the infrastructure we did in the New Age. We haven't.